Our next speaker is Aaron Zauner from Austria, security consultant, and he will tell us about random generators. Random is very important in most cryptographic things, and uh, there are some things that changed in the last years, and he will provide an in-depth update on how randomization and, and generation of good randomness uh, will or should happen in the future. Please give a warm hand for Aaron Zauner. Hey. Um, so originally I was supposed to give the talk like yesterday at half past seven in the evening. So some of you maybe may have been there and expected to see a talk. But I moved the talk around to today because I didn't sleep the whole night before that. I'm running the scanning project here. So we're doing live internet wide scans from a machine that is connected via 10 GB Ethernet. Um, Nick Farr convinced me to do that. So if you're interested in that, you can send a scanning proposal um, to shascan at rzet.org or just look it up in the wiki from Sha um, and participate in that. We already had like for around 30 scans with really cool stuff, UPnP, STDP, um, SS7, different GPRS protocols that run over TCP, um, RDMA over converged Ethernet and stuff like that. So um, just to fill like um, this a bit more, <laughs> because I don't have enough slides, to be honest. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, random number gen generators in operating systems and in programming languages. There is this really well-known blog post by Thomas Pacek that just says, use urandom everywhere. And in general, he's completely right. Filippo Valsorda also had a talk that was pretty similar and was also like kind of based on discussions between Thomas and myself. Um, if you're on Linux, that's, that's totally fine and you should do that, or whatever your language provides. Um, but um, I guess a lot of you are developing software that will be run on other operating systems as well. So that might not be the only option to use or not the, the correct way to, to go. Um, so that was the reason for the title of this talk. Um, I don't have a table of contents, perfect. Okay, so the, why do we need random numbers? I think for most of you, this is pretty, pretty um, straightforward. We need, you need to randomize stuff in your operating system, your scripts, your programs, whatever. Um, for example, there is a rand function from, open, from the OpenSSL library, um, which you should not use, by the way. I'll come ba back to that later on. Um, if you're using Python, you can use um, OSU random, which will, uh, depending on how you call it, give you uh, random bytes. It's, for example, commonly used in transport layer security, so in HTTPS, um, to randomize session cookies, or session tickets, sorry. Cookies and tickets are different things. Um, it's obviously used for key, key generation. So if you're generating an RSA private key, you need to have two large prime numbers, which you choose um, at random, right? And then do a primarity test on it. Um, same thing for Diffie-Hellman. Um, so you need fast random number generators in modern operating systems and languages because some of them, like for TLS, um, if the random number generator would be slow, the whole application and the whole stream would be really slow because everything depends on the random number. You cannot send another TLS, um, uh, it's not called packet, TLS record um, if, you're, if you're still waiting for your RNG to output randomness, right? Um, so for example, there is a RNG in bash it's not really good, but <laughs> you, can, you can use like the um, random thing and it will output a random number. Um, don't use it for, for real security stuff, by the way. It's just a, just a hint. Um, so um, cryptographers like to call random number generators cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator. Um, <laughs> most of you will just call it an RNG or random number generator. Um, but if you're talking to academics or cryptographers or security engineers, they'll probably refer to a ZSPRNG, and that's what they that's what they usually mean by it. It's a secure random number generator based on uh, secure cryptography. So, um, ZSPRNGs are widely implemented in operating system kernels. Obviously, um, the most commonly used. One in Linux is DevU random. It's the random char device in the Linux kernel. Um, there is a man page called, sorry, man4 random, not man random, um, that has been wrong for the last 10 years. It has been fixed last December, finally. 
um, for example, many of you probably recall that there is um, a short paragraph in there on how to read um, the available entropy in the system, um, the um, yeah, how much entropy is available and how much entropy you're lo losing or something like that. These values had no practical uh, implications and actually were just kernel internals you couldn't do anything with. Um, but the man page wrongly assumed that everybody that's going, going to read the man for a RAM page, a uh, random man page, uh, is going to be knowledgeable about the Linux kernel and Linux kernel intrinsics about cryptography and how the uh, random number generator itself works, which is very complicated, by the way, um, or used to be. So I don't know why it doesn't show the first thing, but uh, FreeBSD um, has a random number generator where you can use either def random or def u random or def whatever random. Um, it will always fall back to def u random. It's symlinked as far as I remember. Um, right now it's based on um, a stream cipher XOR construction with um, ASNI instructions if your CPU supports that. So if you have a modern Intel processor or a modern AMD processor, you will have an RD seed and RD rent. Uh, um, what's it called? <laughs> uh, instructions, sorry. <laughs> um, which will then um, at uh, 10 gigabits per second or even more output randomness from the, from the, from the um, uh, central processing unit it's itself. This output, in case it's, it's malicious or in case there is like a, a bug in the CPU, will be XORed against the stream cipher. In this case, it's Charger 20 by DJ Bernstein. Um, they recently had a bug, uh, yeah, on April 16th, there was another improvement, replaced the RC4 algorithm for generating in-kernel secure run numbers with Chatter 20, so that recently happened. RC4 is still in there because OpenBSD, that's like the classical OpenBSD uh, construction for um, uh, the random number device. So that would be like um, either a pool or something like RDC from ANS and I instructions in your C CPU XORed against a stream cipher, which used to be ARC4. Um, they changed that with Charter 20. They, o they already did that in OpenBSD years ago, obviously. Um, but yeah, who uses it anymore? Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, in Windows, there is a couple of ways you can um, get random bytes. Um, usually it's, uh, I think, uh, crypt random or something like that. But for that, you actually have to load a DLL. Um, if you use RDL get random, you don't have any dependencies. Um, this is what Libsodium, for example, does, which is an awesome cryptography library. If you're doing anything in that direction and you want an abstraction for getting random numbers, just l use Libsodium or um, a Libsodium binding in the language you like. Like there's a binding for Python, for Ruby, for Perl. Um, I, I like Lua, for example, there's a binding for that. Um, in programming languages, obviously, you have bindings available to these, as I just so said. So, for example, in Python, you have US random. In PHP, you have rand, which is broken, by the way. Um, they are trying to fix that function in PHP 6, as far as I remember. Um, there's a guy called Scott with a long last name, Polish one. Um, I cannot pronounce. Um, he's working on that. Um, together with uh, Solar Designer, which some of you may know from the Return to Libc attack and like all of his cracking stuff. Um, yeah, um, some of the languages had really, really bad bugs for a long time. Uh, one of the really cool examples that everybody of you will know is the 2008 bug in the in the SSH key, uh, key generation in Debian. So you had predictable SSH keys for years. There's a small tool on the internet that will. Uh, just take uh, a public key from an SSH server and tell you if it's, a, if it's a compromisable key from that period. It was fixed back in 2008, but this is one of the things that many people still go back to, especially when they rant about OpenSSL, right? Because they were using OpenSSL for, for the um, key generation and a Debian maintainer ran Valgrind on a function in the random number generator and tried to fix it. So yeah, by accident, he biased the output of that function. Uh, wait, why is it going to sleep? No. <laughs> it's not my laptop. Um, yeah, by accident, he biased the function, trying to fix a, a memory leak. Um, uh, and thus, you had predictable SSH keys in all of the Debian instances back then. 
Um, it's a long time ago, but some of you may still have legacy machines lying around in some data center that may be vulnerable to this. Like if you do security consulting, I uh, usually, usually look for these keys and I uh, usually find one or two machines out of like three or four hundred that still have vulnerable DB and OpenSSH keys because it's some legacy machine that somebody set up, then left the company. Um, it's interconnected to other systems. If you turn it off, nobody, nothing works anymore, and nobody knows how to administer it. Like the <laughs> standard consulting problem we have in Austria, at least. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, many use the kernel provided uh, CSPRNG. Others use OpenSSL or custom random number generators. This is bad. Don't do it. Um, I'll come back to OpenSSL a bit later. Um, OpenSSL provides a user space um, RNG that many, many uh, programs link to. For example, back then, op uh, OpenSSL HD, they nowadays use something different. Um, from the top of my head, I don't know what, to be honest. Um, and recently, there was a nice uh, bug, like that was two weeks ago. GCC generates incorrect code for RD rent, RD seed intrinsics. Um, yeah, that's a bad bug. It's, it's hard to trigger, but um, yeah, this would be an example of um, a thing that can go wrong in the user land if you develop C code and are trying to either implement your own random number generator with RD rand, RD seed, um, or if you're linking to another library that doesn't do that properly. For example, OpenSSL would be one of those. OpenSSL is perfectly fine for TLS, but if you use a random number generator or a need a random number generator for um, a use case other than TLS, please don't uh, use the OpenSSL one. Um, some history. So, <laughs> um, the def random and def view random devices have really, really old code. Like the first time I looked at the code base, it, it recently changed. Yeah, I know. I'm coming back to it. But um, um, it's really old code. Like uh, when I first looked at it, it was four or five years ago. Uh, most of the commits, except for really small one line documentation commits or typos that were fixed in the code, were from like 1992, 1994, 1996, something like that. Um, it's, it origi originated by, uh, from Ted Tso, one of the also block level developers in, in the Linux kernel, who also um, designed Kerberos version 2, for example, and a lot of other things. So he's knowledgeable about cryptography quite a lot, but he's very, how should I say this <laughs> in a nice way? He's very, f like, his way is the right way, and you c it's very hard to convince him of uh, doing something differently. And um, with subsystem maintainers in the Linux kernel, that's very common. As some of you may know who, who read like, subsystem mailing lists, um, changing some specifics that somebody worked on for a really long time may just not happen, even if you have a better code than they do. Um, as I said before, you don't have to worry about kernel entropy anymore. You never had to worry about it, and that's the actual problem about the mempage that, that, that I mentioned earlier on. Um, it's a myth that you have to uh, read out what the kernel has on entropy. By the way, it doesn't do that anymore. Um, and have DHE or the Havage daemon won't save you at all. Like People come to me and, and, and always ask me if I use HavageD, and it's so awesome. <laughs> then I ask them if, if they read the, the original paper, which is like 10 years old, and assumes Spark <laughs> Or was it Spark 4 machines? And some, some intrinsics about like, these CPUs. It will work on x86 machines, but there is far better ways to, to get good entropy and good random number generators than using like, a really old user land um, daemon. Many, many people do that, I know. Um, and I want to get them away from that, because there is potentially entropy attacks. So people like DJ Bernstein wrote about this in his blog a couple of years ago in 2014. Um, so in theory, you can bias entropy in a way that you, as the person that is biasing it, um, can then calculate either a seed or the actual from the seed the actual random numbers that the, the RNG is uh, giving to the end user or yourself. Um, so as HaveHD obviously is a userland program, it's easier to exploit it because you don't need a, need a ring zero exploit for that. Um, and adding entropy to a system, depending on the quality of the entropy, uh, might actually make the random number, uh, the, the, the stream of random numbers worse, not better. There is like this old myth that if you um, add more entropy into a system, and this has nothing to do with thermodynamics, by the way, <laughs> and that's what many people, I think, mix up in their heads, 
um, if you add entropy to a kernel uh, random number generator, it's just going to be better. It doesn't matter which kind of entropy you add. You can do a cut def null and, and, and write it to u random, and that's going to be fine. No, that's not the case. You can actually BIOS the random number generator. The only reason that doesn't work on Linux is because they thought about that, <laughs> about um, users in user space doing bad stuff. Yeah. Um, so the old Linux kernel implementation from like ancient times until 4.2 um, used, it's really difficult code to read. There's an academic paper on it and a quite nice blog post by Aaron Topnans. Um, so if you're not into reading academic papers, I'd recommend just reading the, the blog post. He also has a newer blog post on how the Linux kernel random number generator nowadays works. That's one of the best I've read. Um, there's also an academic paper of like 20 pages that, it, that re explains every single pool and mixing function in the, in the old random number generator. So that's the def random and def u random device where def random is non-blocking and def u random is blocking. Ah, oh, sorry, the other way around. Def uh, random is uh, blocking and def u random is non-blocking. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite complicated to understand, even for well C, C programmers. We started in a couple of bugs. I opened in language implementations, and their use of uh, kernel RNGs or the operating system RNG, they tried to understand what's going on there. And even though they were like language maintainers, like people that wrote, for example, the, the core code for Ruby or Python, uh, Python is not affected, the core code for Node.js, so C++ or um, Ruby, that C, um, didn't understand the code that I was sending them. And it took me also quite a while to understand it because there's just a lot of mixing functions in there that, that do bit shifting and XORing and, and, and stuff like that. And you, it looks like a cipher design, but it's actually just trying to mix interrupts and information together. Um, as far as we know, the, the old Linux kernel implementation of def random and def u random work without a larger incident. I'm not aware of one. If anybody is, please come up to the stage. <laughs> um, but that worked, I guess, out of pure luck. Because if there would have been researchers that were really trying to attack these uh, mixing functions, we recently looked at some that were um, um, taken out of the kernel code. Um, some of them would have been maybe uh, exploitable, but like in a really um, minor way, so you couldn't pr pr probably in influence what um, um, random numbers of, for example, user and program gets back. Um, but you could influence, I don't know, maybe TCP cookies or something like that. Um, so there's a curiosity. Um, Jason Donenfeld of WireGuard sent me. By the way, I have WireGuard stickers. I have to spread out. It's not stickers. <laughs> oh. So there are stickers here if anybody wants one. So why I got is this new cool in-kernel VPN um, that Jason Donovan uh, wrote um, with uh, mainly algorithms by Daniel Bernstein and JP Omasson. He implemented most of that. He's also working on redoing a lot of the crypto implementations in the Linux kernel right now. So like two weeks ago, uh, Jason and JP Omasson um, implemented zip hash as a replacement for MD5 in the Linux kernel um, because MD5 is used everywhere in the Linux kernel for hash tables and stuff like that. And obviously, you can get a hash collision if um, you have a system that is big enough. There is this story he told me recently on a Slack channel. <laughs> um, he came across this fast mix function. I'd really like to show you the code. Can I do that here? Is there internet here? I have no idea. Wait a second. I don't know how the system works. It's not mine. Um, doesn't matter. Just go to tinyworld.com uh, slash fastmix. Um, um, there is like this code by this guy called George Spe uh, Speflin. Spevlin, um, that wrote it like 10 years ago. This guy is not a cryptographer. Apparently, he was uh, involved in seismic measurements and earthquake detection. And for some really weird reason, he wrote a new mixing function for the, for the random number generator in the Linux kernel, which is, by the way, still in there. So Jason is trying to get it out of there. Um, right now, even with the new uRandom design, um, this mixing function is still in there as a backup or fallback. I'm not sure if it's used by default. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. I would have to look it up. I think that's like nice trivia to have. Um, so the current implementation of the of the um, 
RNG in the Linux kernel. Um, it took years to discuss with Ted So and a couple of other people of, of the original authors of Def Random and Def U Random um, about a new design for the random number genera generator in Linux. It's all in uh, drivers char random.c. Um, but after like a year of discussion and a German guy that wrote a pluggable interface for different algorithms or stream ciphers to be used in, in random number generators and the 100 page white paper, they decided to actually uh, change the current implementation. Um, the current implementation is also a one based, uh, written by that Ted Tso, but um, it's largely copied from what Boring SSL does. So if you, if you n never heard of Boring SSL, um, Boring SSL is like Google's fork of OpenSSL. And so what they did, or what basically Adam Langley and a couple of other people from the Chrome, uh, Chrome security team did, was fork OpenSSL at a certain point, and then ripped everything out that was senseless, and rename all of the function names and the indentation scheme so you can actually work with it. Um, <laughs> then they uh, got rid of all of the tests that were written for OpenSSL and rewrote all of them in Go. <laughs> um, so if you want to use it, it actually works but it has very limited capabilities. So it's, it's nice to use as a TLS library, but you cannot use it like OpenSSL in a general way. So, so say I want to use triple dash for some weird reason, and I want to link against uh, libcrypto. Um, that won't, won't work with, with boring SSL. But if you want to use it in a TLS implementation, it's really fast, it's really nice. Um, and what Ted So did, and Adam Lange before him, um, was to decide, okay, we, we're going to, to see which architecture we are on. If we're on a modern Intel or AMD CPU and executing there, um, we have RD RAND and RD seed instructions from the AS and I extensions. Uh, both uh, Intel and AMD CPU supported, by the way, it's not only Intel. Some people think that. Um, and then we're going to get um, a seed or entropy from uh, AS and I via the RD seed instruction and XOR it with Charger 20, a stream cipher that is known to be quite good and non-reversible. Um, so that's a neat design. It's backtracking resistant as well. So um, if you get the, um, <coughs> the output of a random number at some point, you won't be able to even, if you get the seed at some point, the original seed, to um, go back in time and calculate the random numbers that the RNG was outputting at a certain point in time. That's backtracking resistance in, in like a few words. It's a bit more difficult. So uh, I just ran this thing uh, on a server of mine. Um, so with block size one megabit, uh, megabytes, you get like 90 megabytes per second. And it used to be 10 megabytes per second. And depending on the block size, it gets even faster, obviously. So that's the current implementation um, from 4.2 on. I think I have 4.11 on this machine. <coughs> Sorry. Um, there is also other major work overhauling crypto code in the kernel started with Linux 4.2. It doesn't only affect the random num number generator, as I said, Jason Donnefeld, the guy that writes uh, WireGuard, um, is also involved in some of the, the work there, and as are many of the original kernel developers. So they are trying to like, get MD5 out of everything and write cleaner code that other people will understand. They added backtracking protection to the um, Charger 20 based um, URandom imp implementation. There is a link there. I'll put the slides online afterwards, so you can click on them without like, writing it off to the screen. Um, so this is what Ted so ro uh, wrote on uh, June 13, 2016, last year. With Dev random, we were always emitting more bytes than we had entropy available, because not blocking was considered more important. Previously, we were relying on the security of SHA-1, with ASCTR DBRG, which is a deterministic random bit generator, uh, you rely on the security uh, with AES, and that's fine. Um, so yeah, the entropy thing is basically also um, gone, um, as it is from the main, main page. And uh, they also have a commit in there that um, disables, um, for example, that you can um, get a, a, do a cut on proc entropy available or something like that. These interfaces just don't exist anymore in the ProcFS file system. Um, they were taken out because people were using them the wrong way. And um, 
wrongly understood what they what they meant or what the impact is of like having low entropy. Like a system doesn't run out of entropy. It just doesn't work like that. Um, embedded system maybe. But. Um, so there is another patch that replaces U, uh, the U, U random pool that was used uh, before with the new random number generator. Um, a blog post, uh, po post from Nikos Mavri Ganopoulos, um, who is the GNU TLS um, core maintainer. I know I share this, uh, this opinion. Um, to their defense, they will have to provide a call which doesn't make applications fail in the following scenario. Crypto SSL libraries are compiled to use get random, the function call, because it is available in libc and in the kernel. Um, everything works fine. The administrator downgrades the kernel to a version without get random because th his network card works better with that version, mayhem as application fa uh, applications fail. This actually happens um, in live production scenarios, and he's very right about that. You should use the get random call if you need, uh, if you need uh, randomness in your application or whatever your, your scripting language or um, programming language um, provides you in its standard library. But um, get random is like the, f the future thing to use. But current libc, like if you, if you use a Debian stable version, the libc on it won't have the, this function call. So you cannot use it. Um, same thing for Red Hat. CentOS, Fedora, and like I think uh, it's also not fixed in Gen 2, which is weird. Um, I think the, the, only, uh, the only distribution that has get random everywhere in all of the different branches is uh, Arch Linux, but I'm not really sure about that. Don't take my word for it. Um, they also had an, uh, another nice patch um, for Numa systems. So on a system with a four socket uh, on a system with a four socket NUMA system where a large number of application threads were all trying to reach from def U random, this can result in the system spending eighty percent of its time contending on a global U random spin log. The application should have used its own PRNG, but let's try to help from running. Lemming like straight over the uh, locking cliff, whatever the, the last sentence means. So that's also a post by Tetsu. <laughs> um, so they were fixing uh, new topology things um, and Im uh, improving the performance of the view random. Um, if you're using the OpenSSL RNG, that's, that's uh, uh, nice to note on the side. It's not uh, uh, thread or fork safe. So if you use that RNG and fork, for example, um, yeah, you will get uh, predictable random numbers. Um, so the myths, myths and lies of uh, man for random are finally corrected. This happened in, I think, de late December of 2016, so last year. Um, the guy that um, maintains the Linux kernel documentation, he wanted to change it for years because he knew, he knew it was wrong. Um, but the actual implementers of the, of the uh, random char, char device uh, um, protested against the man page change. Um, what was in this man page had a huge impact on random number generators used in programming languages. I'll, I'll come, come to that right away. So language issues, Ruby. <laughs> it's like one of, the, one, of, one, of my, uh, one of the things I got famous for on Hacker News for like, screaming at Ruby core developers on a like, the disk bug report that is some, somewhere down there. I even, I even printed a t-shirt. Um, so in Ruby, if you use... Um, uh, Ruby provides a random number generator which just doesn't work, and there is one that every proper Ruby program programmer uses that's called Secure Random, where the S and the R are capital letters. So if you want proper randomness, you would think you'd like um, import or require in this case, sorry, it's Python versus Ruby, require Secure Random, and then you get random numbers. This is in general w would be true, except if you have any bug in OpenSSL or in OpenSSL's RNG implementation or in the way they call the RNG implementation in OpenSSL. For example, if, if they would use threading or a fork, it wouldn't work. Um, out of luck, that wasn't the case, but I also didn't have time to, to look for writing an, a proper exploit. Um, so in this bug report, this is like the legendary bug mentioned down there. It's like me, um, Tony Arricieri, who wrote a wrapper for um, Secure Random later on, so you could just call sysrandom and it would use the operating system RNG and uh, wrap around secure random. Um, Filippo Valsorda, who also had a talk on, on urandom, uh, a couple of proper cryptographers 
Uh, yeah, myself trying to convince the Ruby core team to change the use of their uh, random number generator and how they use OpenSSL. And uh, like, I, I, I wasn't rude in the first place. Later on, yes, <laughs> I have to be honest. Um, but I saw that there was an open bug for like four years that said, please change the implementation of your RNG, but by some guy I've never met and never posted in the thread again. So I picked it up and said, like, guys, this is actually important. I work on exploits in this direction. You should fix this. I used to be a Ruby developer, um, so I would, would have to like this fixed. Um, it took like two months, and then some guy in really bad English wrote back, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking why. Um, and basically the answer was, yeah, because OpenSSL is very good. <laughs> and uh, like if really read that bug report, um, it's really funny what some of the comments are. Um, like some of the comments I wrote on a uh, I printed on a T-shirt and ordered by like coffee press. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, in reality it, it wasn't properly implemented, and it took like four or five security engineers, two of them proper proper like PhDs in cryptography and, and mathematics, like a year to convince them to change that. And what made them actually change it around was this thing. The man page was changed upstream, and then they agreed to change the implementation because they were relying on the man page. And they were, they were always referencing, like in all, all of the arguments they made in, in this bug report, they were referencing the, the um, U, uh, random form man page from Linux and said, like, this is the way we have to do it. It says in there. And, uh, like, pasted them code from, from the implementation. Like, no, it, that's not really how it works. You can read C code. Please try to understand it. And then I posted like 10 or 15 academic papers with um, how the random number generator actually works in Linux and with, which attacks are possible on the OpenSSL RNG. Um, and they just didn't care. You can come up with, you could come up with the best arguments even with a working exploit and they wouldn't change it. But when, they finally ch when uh, Linux finally changed um, what's, what's in the man page of um, uh, man for random, they were actually convinced to, to change the implementation. So what they're doing now is uh, use a similar design to Lipsodium. Um, if you're not familiar with Lipsodium, um, it's a real nice library and there's wrappers in all of the other languages for it um, by Frank Dennis. Um, so Lipsodium basically looks, okay, on which platform am I on? On which operating system am I on? And um, do we need random numbers or bytes? That's just a different function core. And then it decides if, if it uses defu random, um, RTL, gen crypt, or what it was on Windows. Uh, at, uh, I have to look up, wait. Yeah, on Windows it's RTL, get random. Um, and so that, then they decide on the, on the best way to, to get randomness from the operating system, not from user space. And that's the way you should actually do that. And Ruby now does something similar, except that they don't just link in Libsodium. They copy and paste some stuff from the OpenBSD kernel and just use that. I don't know why. Um, but it should be fairly, fairly OK now. So yeah, some of the statements were like, secure random without OpenSSL or, or compatible alternatives is nonsense. And I got a please don't root very often uh, from the core developers. Um, the simula simula issue is in open, uh, sorry, in uh, Node.js. Um, there is like this really long bug report. If you open it up, um, the GitHub issue is, I don't know, if you, if you would print it out on A4 paper, it would be probably like 20 or 30 pages. Um, and it's mostly people that are using Node.js who have no experience with, with uh, crypto engineering or with cryptography or with security in general. It's just normal Node.js users trying to, I don't know, impress core developers in, the, in this bug report or like say what they have to say. And it's, it's, it's like an endless thread of people just posting nonsense that has nothing to do with the actual security issue. Um, the latest comment uh, was while I was here, so I had to change the slide. Um, this is from like two days ago, a guy uh, wrote like note that OpenSSL Open has just landed a commit to use DRBG with, with ASCTR from NIST, SB 890A. It's like the NIST uh, spe uh, special publication um, for um, random number generators, I think. And they have a recommendation in there which um, 
how a random number generator design should look like. Um, by default, define flag of open SSL ran seed OS. I think it's best to wait for us for the next release of open SSL 111. Um, a quick note about that. Like the way Node.js actually um, links against OpenSSL is very weird. They have their own fork of OpenSSL in their code tree. Um, so they forked OpenSSL at some specific version and then put it in their own code buff. So if you go into like in the, in the code of Node.js and go into source external or dep or something like that, you will see an OpenSSL directory um, with an unknown fork and they even changed around the version number. Um, so everything that, that OpenSSL changes, they have to re-import somehow. Um, obviously, if there is a bug in the code that for, that they forked at some point, um, they won't get the updates from upstream. They'll have to find out about that. Somebody has to, to notify them, and then they have to fix it themse themselves by hand. They don't only do that with OpenSSL, they do it with a couple of dependencies on OGS has. Um, yeah, like it's no GS. It's not the proper programming language. <laughs> Don't use it. <laughs> like single threaded applications are shit. <laughs> Seriously though, like there's there's really large web companies that use Node.js as microservices and run it everywhere, and then they're wondering why they're maxing out CPUs and like I cannot call an Uber. Why? Because it uses Node.js. <laughs> That's true, by the way. Um, so the same issue as. Um, exists in Erlang. I didn't have enough time to finish this slide, to be honest, um, because I was busy with the um, scanning stuff. Um, same as in Ruby and in Node.js, um, there is, except there is no discussion going on. I opened a bug report about it, I think, a year ago. Um, I don't think anybody replied to it. Um, the implementation is exactly as it was in Ruby, and it is still in Node.js. Um, they just use the OpenSSL uh, user space random number generator. So that's also an issue. And if you want to look for more languages that do that, I'm sure more languages do that. Um, Python is not one of them, by the way. Um, Python does the proper thing um, and uses uRandom, or depending on what operating system you're on, the correct function call on Windows, for example. Um, if you want to find out more languages that actually have this issue, just look at the code base and find out where like, the crypto stuff is. And somewhere there will be a random call. Like if you go on GitHub, you can just enter random and then you'll see how it works. And I'm sure there is more languages out there that, that, that um, have either a broken RNG they implemented themselves or um, use the, the OpenSSL one, which they shouldn't use. Um, so there was a Python improvement about insecure values for big, um, big amounts of data from, from secure random in Python 3.6 or something like that. That was only a, an improvement. It's not really an issue or a vulnerability or a bug. As I said, Python does the correct thing and uses um, the operating system kernel random number generator. So um, what's the issue with OpenSSL again, just to reiterate? It's not threat, uh, threat safe. It runs in user space. Um, it's, as we know, it's prone to bugs. And it's especially prone to bugs in code paths that people rarely look at. So for example, after Hartley, pe people started to look at OpenSSL really hard. The core team was extended by four developers, two of them paid by the OpenSSL Foundation, two of them paid by Google. So the actual um, OpenSSL code is quite nice nowadays. If you look at like a, um, a current version, um, it has even a proper indentation scheme and function calls are re uh, renamed um, to be obvious. And, and OpenSSL really improved after Hotbleed uh, and it was one of the really nice things. Um, but what researchers in academia and also in, in, like on the, in the black scene and, and expert development usually do, they look at obvious code paths like TLS. Can I, can I uh, hack some bug in OpenSSL that I can decrypt traffic? Because that's interesting, right? But most people don't really have a lot of knowledge about random number generators, how they work, or how to exploit them. So that's one of, the, one of the things in OpenSSL that even the core team from OpenSSL themselves hasn't looked at for a long time, as far as I know. Like, I talked to a few people from them, and I was like, yeah, like, hand wavy. I'm not exactly sure how it works and what it does in this, in this specific case. So I'd rather not use it if the core team doesn't know how it works. Um, there is this, like, wiki page from OpenSSL themselves and an issue on, on, on the topic. 
to change um, what OpenSSL uses um, to the operating system provided random number generator or what like Lip Lipsodium does, so depending on the operating system and architecture, um, do something um, specific. Um, but if you go to the wiki page of um, OpenSSL to random numbers, it clearly says, don't use our random number generator. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I have no idea. I, like, and this is one of the things I posted the Ruby guys, like on the wiki it says you shouldn't use it. Like, yeah, but what, you, what, what else to use? We don't know. So they didn't change it. It was really annoying. I was really pissed off. Um, yeah, like all of the people from OpenSSL that I talked to were not aware how it really works internally and how secure it actually is but because there, there wasn't an audit on this part of the code. Like most of the TLS code is very well audited because um, companies like Google and uh, security consultancies like NCC Group uh, regularly uh, audit uh, the TLS part of the, of the system or um, um, or specific function calls that people often use. For, for example, OpenSSL, com, uh, OpenSSL functions that would be linked into and used for file encryption in some tools, or I don't know. These, these are things that are usually well audited and nowadays are kind of safe to use. And I don't know of a better library to use ex instead of OpenSSL, to be honest. Like there is a really nice C++ library called Botan, but if you're stuck on C, I'd stick to OpenSSL. LibreSSL is just shit, and boring SSL is only TLS. So, uh, yeah, have GHE. Um, like I'm on this crypto mailing list for like better crypto, and we have this large document we wrote in 2013 after the Snowden revelations on how to con properly configure your services, routers, and um, software demons to use strong cryptography. And like every four months, there's this guy who comes up, or like this person is always another person, and asks about RNGs and why we have have GHE in there because somebody added it to it, to the document. Um, so I removed it from the document and said to uh, everybody should use Libsodium or the, uh, the the kernel random number generator if they're on Linux 4.2 upwards. Um, and obviously, it started a big discussion. Like people were arguing have GHE, they have used for years, never had a problem, but then again, they also never looked if they had a problem with it. Um, so one of the people in the discussion actually made an effort and wrote to the guys, to the original developers of um, have GHE, the algorithm and the implementation. It's both um, designed by, I think, ENS in Paris. ENS or in Rio in Paris, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, ENS or in Rio. Um, and from like five people he wrote to, only one responded because he still had a working email address there. <laughs> this guy told him, uh, yeah, it should be perfectly fine, but by the way, I haven't looked at the code in 10 years. <laughs> and this is like the core developer. Um, there is no security analysis of HFGAG except for the... The right pussy? What? Pussy? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, <I'm a> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, there is no, like in the original paper for the HFGHE algorithm, there is a security analysis. Obviously, if you implement a security software or an algorithm, you should do a security analysis in your own paper and then wait for crypto analysis or security audits by other parties. For HFGHE, this, this never happened. Like, nobody ever audited the code. Um, the algorithm itself, um, and as far as I can see, like in the code, it's really old C code. Um, it uses intrinsics from, as I said, old Spark machines um, for entropy generation collection, um, which obviously, if you're not running like a Spark 64 machine anymore, which on Debian you can't because it's a deprecated architecture, and I think only FreeBSD supports it anymore, and NetBSD, OpenBSD. Um, it won't be better than what you have on your system anyway. And like with the blog post I linked to earlier, the entropy attacks that Daniel Bernstein mentions, it would theoretically be possible to bias your um, random number generator if you use half GHE and exploit a bug in it so that like the randomness that half GHE provides 
additionally to the system random number generator would be malicious. So you can actually do really bad things with that. And it runs in user land. It is, it's, you don't need a ring, ring zero exploit to exploit this stuff. You just need to look at their C code and you see that it's like really not that good. It's, it's nice academic code, but it's not a proper security code that I would use in an operating system. It's not developed anymore, and they don't, uh, they don't ship any updates to the code. Um, as far as I can see, even from people that wrote, like they don't have a bug tracker or a security address. It's like a page that says have GHE, and this is a research pro project from 10 years ago. So obviously it's not maintained like an open source project. It's maintained like, uh, like a scientific project that somebody did for their PhD thesis or their master thesis. Um, so there is no way to send in bug reports. And even if you want to do that, you have to find out like this one guy has still a working email address out of five, to five of the core developers. And then he doesn't change the code anymore. So I have no idea how to get a bug fix in there if, if there is uh, something to fix, for example. Uh, I wouldn't use it. And I removed it from all of the documents that other people wrote and um, sent me. Yeah, parting words. I don't know. It was like the slide I wrote when I was running into it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, what can we learn from that? Um, usually the, the operating system provided random number generator should be pristine and very good. There have been obviously problems with that. Um, a really well-known problem is f like three or four years ago, FreeBSD decided to implement something similar as Linux just did and use um, the ASNI instructions if they're on AMD64 um, to get um, high bandwidth um, randomness. They somehow fucked up the code <laughs> and uh, got a biased, random num uh, biased randomness out of that. And nobody noticed it for four months. It was in, in the current tree, I think. It wasn't in a, in a it wasn't in a release, but it was in the current tree and people run that. So uh, yeah, they had, they had a, like a, yeah, a BIOS random number generator for four, for four months in FreeBSD. So that happens, but it rarely ha ever happens. It's like the only time it happened during, um, since, free, since the inception of FreeBSD. For Linux, I'm not aware of any, any instances like that, only of user lens issues like the Debian OpenSSL debacle and um, other OpenSSL RNG problems. Uh, Windows and Solaris, for example, I have never heard of any issues with the, with the random number generators. Solaris had a re didn't have a random number generator up, up until a certain um, SunOS version, so you had to write your own script to get OpenSSH working. I remember that from like 15 years ago. But if you run a, a current Solaris or Illumos or whatever um, operating system, this will work just fine. So yeah, thanks. Do you have any questions? I think we got five minutes. Or something. So yeah, thanks for your talk. And we do have some time for questions. But uh, please keep the questions short so we can fit as many in as possible. Go ahead, please. Turn audio, up Angel, audio. would you be so kind and switch on the microphone? <laughs> Okay. Uh, test, test. Yeah. Um, you second. said you shouldn't use LibreSSL. Wait, wait a second. It has to be on the recording as well, right? So we have two microphones for questions in the hall. So you could also try the other one. Let's see which one works first, and that one, that person then gets to answer, uh, gets to put the question first. I could just give him his, the microphone for a second, I guess. Is mine working? Yeah, okay. Is it no? It's, ah, it's oh, on. Oh, no, it works, ah. okay. Uh, you said you shouldn't use LibreSSL. Why is that? Ha! I knew that was the first question. <laughs> so, like, I'm originally a free BSD guy. I really like BSD. But let's be honest, most of the people run Linux nowadays. Most of the enterprises uh, work at do. Um, I'd really like to deploy more free BSD machines, for example, but it usually gets declined. The problem with OpenBSD projects is like they have a project for everything. There is like their own implementation for NTP, their own implementation for PGP, their own implementation for everything, basically. Because at some point they figure we can do it better. And mostly they are right. But with a project like LibreSSL, like there is vulnerabilities in LibreSSL that are not in OpenSSL. 
And that's just because of the way they were treating the code base. They were just like, this is shit, we are ripping that out. This is shit, we are ripping that out, without knowing the history of the code. And in OpenSSL, although the original developer um, is called Lay, um, that's why some of the function calls are called SSL Lay, um, um, although he's not working on the project anymore, there's people in, open, in the OpenSSL core team that has, have been around for 15 to 20 years. So they know the history of most of the code part, at least at some in some sp spare room in their head, if they remember it. It's a long time ago, right? But um, So there's vulnerabilities that only LibreSSL is affected to. They sometimes don't import um, upstream changes from OpenSSL that really make sense, and I have no idea why. And it's two guys. So, yeah. Thank you for this answer. Uh, would like you like to ask the next question, please? I know like a couple of other projects where it was two guys, and it was one guy, and five years later it was unmaintained, and it was an OpenVC project, like OpenNTPD, for example. Okay, Sorry. so you said that the uh, new version of the Linux kernel ONG doesn't count the entropy anymore. Um, no. But is, did I got that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but this is fairly important. Uh, oh. Oh, well, it is in the beginning. So we had a paper like mining your P's and Q's, where we had the problem that all the embedded systems yeah. don't have a proper source of randomness. Oh, sorry for not but citing the paper, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but we had, so I'm just noted, I'm not involved with the paper, I just know it, oh, I okay. read it. Uh, but there was another paper that this also affects um, desktop, desktop computers because a lot of the keys are created at one time before the user presses the first key. So when the system doesn't have collected a sufficient amount of entropy. So I agree that once you have a sufficient amount of, amount of entropy, that doesn't decrease by uh, extracting random numbers unless you have a flawed RNG. Yeah. But you need to uh, achieve a certain amount of, uh, of entropy before you output your first random number. Yeah. And that is a critical uh, thing you need to maintain. So this is totally correct. <laughs> I would really like to see the, the, the paper on the desktop environment because I, I cannot think of a scenario where a desktop wouldn't have enough entropy at boot time, mm. but especially with systemd, but that's a different story. Um, there is a, there's a bug uh, where they had to change a uh, random code because of systemd, by the way. I forgot to put it in there. Um, so for embedded devices, this is totally true, yes. And it's an ongoing discussion on the Linux kernel mailing list how to deal with that because basically it's up to the designer of the embedded board to figure out a way to give interrupts to the operating system so it can like, collect entropy. If, there, if, if it's like a, 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 an embedded board without a real-time real clock and without a network interface, how the fuck are you ever going to get entropy? It's like an open and unsolved well, problem as far as I know. I do a lot of embedded development on the embedded board. You have a lot of entropy sources. You just n uh, need to use them and you need to... They are, Different on every board. Yeah, but, but I can. Can we have the discussion yeah, after I the talk and uh, now the next question, the please? Yeah. So this is something where usually the embedded developers would write a kernel patch and send a new driver upstream to the kernel, and then it would work. But, yeah. I've been I've been using a DVB-T dongle on an ARM board to speed up RSA key. Uh, Sorry, come again. I didn't understand. I've been you. using a USB uh, DVB-T dongle. To, to gather extra uh, radio uh, entropy okay. on the arm board yeah. to uh, create the initial RSA key for the device. Yeah. Uh, I just understand adding extra entropy was a bad idea. Uh, could you elaborate that on that a bit more? Like without doing a proper hardware audit and software audit of the SDK that the, um, the USB stick uses, I cannot tell you if it's actually improving your entropy situation or it's making it worse. I don't know. But if it's radio waves, right? Yes. So radio waves can be externally influenced. You just need, a, like I have a USB at home, I just need to know the frequency um, your USB dongle is capturing at and just replay traffic all of the time, then it's going to be the same bits, right? <laughs> Might be a, an attack that would be cool. But yeah, if, if it's properly implemented in software, it won't, it will just discard similar bits. But I don't know, I don't know the, the USB dongle, but that would be a cool attack to pull off. So, thanks a lot for this talk. I don't think there are any more questions. I believe Aaron will be around uh, so you can discuss your questions uh, or uh, have a discussion with him about some of the stuff he uh, enlightened us about. Uh, please give a warm hand for Aaron. <laughs>